All right, welcome to the lecture where we don't talk about anything beyond work a bunch of problems. This is to help you get ready for the midterm exam where we give you questions all the way ranging from chapters 1 to 10. So kind of a halfway through the course a review of the types of problems you should have already learned in all of the different uh, chapters leading up to this point. But it'll be good review. So with that, let's get started. I will say for a lot of these questions, we kind of set an initial question up and then ask a lot of smaller individual questions using the same scenario or the same prescription. So uh, as we will with this first one, but let's start with this first uh, scenario for setup for the first group of questions. And it states, a patient has been prescribed four milligrams of morphine sulfate to be given every two hours as needed for severe pain. Now, a formula for the morphine sulfate and droperidol injection for a patient-controlled analgesia is as follows. And then we have the prescription below that says morphine sulfate 200 milligrams, droperidol 8 milligrams, lactic acid QS, and 0.9% sodium chloride injection QSAD 100 milliliters. So let's break this down. Before we even get to the first question, let's make sure we know what's happening here. Essentially, we are having, producing a cassette with enough drug in it that this cassette can be attached to a patient's patient-controlled analgesia or PCA pump. This allows the patient to only get the morphine when they need it. So it's not going to run continuously. There's no morphine that's automatically given to the person. The only time it's given is when they push the button. When they push the button, then the pump will pump in four milligrams of morphine sulfate as for their pain. Well, you think, well, okay, well, what keeps the person from just hitting the button, 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 button. Well, we don't want them to overdose on morphine. So keep in mind, every time they push the button, they'll get a four milligram dose, but then the pump will lock out and not accept another button push for at least two hours. So again, they can only give themselves, uh, by pushing the button, a single dose of morphine sulfate, which would be four milligrams, and they can only push that button or they can only receive a dose from pushing the button every two hours. So that's kind of the setup as far as what we're trying to provide. This cassette that could last for several days, we'll calculate that here in a little bit, but allow them to be able to push the button when they need it and get a four milligram dose, but no, not more frequent than every two hours. Okay, that's the situation. Now let's look at the actual prescription for the cassette, the fluid we're going to make. This fluid is going to have a QSAD, means up to a total volume of 100 milliliters. So this pump will have 100 milliliters of fluid total. Okay. What's not drug is going to be essentially sodium chloride, 0.9% sodium chloride, since that's an isotonic sodium chloride solution. We'll have isotonic saline in there. The drugs that will be in there will be a total of, in all 100 mils, there'll be a total of 200 milligrams of the opioid analgesic morphine sulfate. So that's really the pain medicine. There's another ingredient in there called droperidol, and there'll be 8 milligrams total in the 100 mils. Droperidol is added particularly to help deal with some of the nausea and stomach upset that occurs when given morphine. Morphine can cause a lot of nausea and vomiting, so possibly. So we want to avoid that by having a drug that will essentially be an anti-emetic or help us avoid the nausea and vomiting, and that's the droperidol. And that's 8 milligrams per the 100 mils again. The other ingredient that we'll get to a little bit later is lactic acid. And clearly you think, oh my God, why would we give lactic acid? We're only going to be giving very, a very small amount. But that's being used simply as an, an acidifier because morphine sulfate itself as a drug is relatively basic. So we don't want our IV solution to be too basic and cause problems like that. So we're going to slightly acidify it so that it's more of a neutral pH when we inject it. So realize that's more of a formulation ingredient to make sure our final solution isn't too basic. All right, NPH, I should say. All right, so now that's the scenario. Let's start answering some questions about it. So it says, the first question is, how many days should this preparation last if the patient uses the maximum dose? So if they hit the button every two hours and give themselves four milligrams every two hours, how long will this cassette last? That's an important question to know when we would need to make some more. So where do we start with it? There seems like there's, with these questions, always a lot of information. 
But what's going to determine how long the preparation lasts will be two things, how quickly we use it, but also how much of the preparation do we have to start with. So let's start with that one. What total volume of solution do we have? So we're gonna, that's why we start with the 100 milliliters. That's what we know is we have defined, we have 100 mils of solution. We want to know how long that solution is going to last. Well, since the dosing is based off of the morphine sulfate, let's first convert our total volume to the weight or the amount of morphine sulfate provided within that volume. So we'll take the 100 milliliters and multiply it by the fact that we know that we put 200 milligrams of morphine sulfate in that 100 milliliters. So if we multiply that way, the milliliters units cancel, and now we're in milligrams of morphine sulfate. Now we need to get eventually over to time, so we need to first convert the weight or the amount of morphine sulfate to the number of doses that that amount of morphine sulfate will provide. So we were told in the question that every dose will contain 4 milligrams of morphine sulfate. So let's multiply by the fact that for every one dose, it will contain on the bottom four milligrams of morphine sulfate. Now milligrams of morphine sulfates cancel and we're in the number of doses. If we did the math up to this point, we would know how many doses will be contained in that 100 milliliters. But we want to know time. So let's convert dose to time by the fact that we know that this patient can only get a dose every two hours. They're locked out to getting it any sooner than that. And the question tells us they do get it at the maximum dose. So we're going to multiply the dose times. There are two hours on top for every one dose. My units of dose cancel and now I'm in hours. However, the question wanted to know how many days. So let's convert hours to days by multiplying the fact that in one day on top there are 24 hours. So again my units of hours cancel. So now our final remaining units are in days. So if we do that math, starting with 100 milliliters and do the math all the way from left to right across, you should numerically get the result of 4.17. And remember the remaining units was days. So this 100 milliliters will last 4.17 days if the patient pushes that button every two hours around the clock. And that answers this first question. The second question in the same scenario says, how many micrograms of dromperidol is the patient receiving with each dose? That's kind of an interesting question because the question tells us how much morphine they're getting with each dose. We know they're getting four milligrams of morphine, but it doesn't tell us how much dromperidol they're getting. All we know about the dromperidol is, is that there are eight milligrams total in the hundred mils. So once again, this can be kind of a confusing question on where to start with. But what really defines how much droperidol they'll be getting is the volume administered with every dose of morphine. So let's start with the morphine dose because we know the morphine dose is 4 milligrams. So we're going to start with that 4 milligrams of morphine sulfate and let's convert that into the volume that's administered to give 4 milligrams. To do that, we take 4 milligrams of morphine sulfate. We'll multiply it by the fact that we know in this 100 milliliter cassette of solution we made, we put a total of 200 milligrams of morphine sulfate. So now milligrams of morphine sulfate cancel, and we're in milliliters. That would be the volume in mils administered to give the amount of morphine. Well, that's the volume that's going to also give our drone paradol. So let's multiply that volume by the concentration of droperidol in our solution, which is eight milligrams of droperidol for every 100 milliliters. Now milliliters cancel and we will be in milligrams of droperidol. But the question did ask for our answer in micrograms. So our last step is to multiply by 1000 micrograms over every one milligram so that our milligrams cancel and our final units will be in micrograms. So once again, starting with the four milligrams on the left and working numerically all the way over, if we solve for that, our answer numerically should be 160, and our last remaining units would be micrograms. And that means that our final answer is 160 micrograms of droperidol is administered every time the patient pushes a button and gets four milligrams of morphine sulfate. All right. 
third question with the same scenario is, what is the percent concentration of weight per volume of morphine sulfate and droperidol in this solution? All right, because we weren't we were given milligrams, so we know there's 200 milligrams, and we know that's in a, a hundred milliliters for uh, the morphine, and no eight milligrams per hundred mils for droperidol. So let's simply convert those concentrations to percent weight per volume. All right, we'll do this one at a time. So let's set up the proportion of our morphine sulfate, which we know we have, which is 200 milligrams of morphine sulfate over 100 milliliters. Now the trick to understand is that percent weight per volume has the units of grams per milliliter. In particularly percent weight per volume is grams per 100 milliliters. The good news is we already have the amount of morphine expressed per 100 milliliters, so we won't have to adjust the volume. All we need to do really is convert the 200 milligrams to grams. So let's do that by multiplying 200 milligrams times one gram on top per 1,000 milligrams on the bottom, so the units of milligrams cancel. And if we basically take 200, divide that by 1,000, and leave it, and you get essentially 0.2 grams of morphine sulfate. And we won't divide out the 100 mils because we want it expressed as a percent, so we have that 0.2 grams of morphine sulfate in 100 milliliters, which by definition, therefore, means we have 0.2% weight per volume of morphine sulfate. All right, let's do that same exact thing for droperidol. Pretty straightforward. We know there was eight milligrams in our 100 milliliters of fluid. So let's just convert milligrams to grams by multiplying by one gram over 1,000 milligrams. Milligrams cancel, and what that really represents is 0.008 grams per 100 mils, or 0.008% weight per volume droperidol. All right, and that answers this question. All right, the fourth question related to the same scenario involves the lactic acid. And the question is, is that the lactic acid is supplied as an 85% weight per weight solution with a specific gravity of 1.2. Now, if 0 0.4 milliliters of lactic acid solution is used to adjust the pH, what is the final percent in weight per volume strength of lactic acid in our final injection? Okay, so this is a little confusing. I like this one because there's weight per weight, there's weight per volume. You have to be careful, and there's a specific gravity. So this really is not so much about difficult math as lining up and keeping your units straight. And I guess the question is, where do we start? Let's start with the amount of lactic acid solution. The other thing you want to be careful here is we want to know the final percent strength of lactic acid. Okay, We were given a volume of lactic acid solution, and they're not exactly the same thing. The solution is what contains the lactic acid, but our final answer will be a weight percent, weight per volume of lactic acid. All right, so let's start with the lactic acid solution. And by that, what I mean is that we know that we added 0 0.45 milliliters of lactic acid solution, and we put that into a total volume of 100 mils. So on the far left of this equation, all I'm doing is restating what we were given in the question was that we have a 0 0.45 milliliters of lactic acid solution, and this is an important abbreviation. I'm abbreviating that LAS. LAS stands for lactic acid solution, okay? And that volume was in 100 milliliters, all right? Now, we're not going to mess with 100 milliliters, but keep in mind, this was all occurring in 100 milliliters. So what we need to do is get rid of the volume of lactic acid solution and get to a weight of just lactic acid. So the first conversion will be to use the concentration of, or I'm sorry, the, the specific gravity of the lactic acid solution to convert from the volume of that solution to its weight. So keep in mind the specific gravity of 1.2 means that there is 1.2 grams of lactic acid solution for every gram of lactic acid solution. Remember, specific gravity is the grams of the, 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 the solution per gr gram of uh, reference source. 
So in this case, since it's water, we can treat it like a density. So again, since in biology we use specific gravity, the reference source solution for specific gravity is always water, and water has a density of one gram per mil, then the specific gravity is the same as the density. And hopefully we've kind of clarified that in this course up to this point, so this is not rocket science. So let me get back to the question. Keep in mind, we have 0.45 milliliters of lactic acid solution. Since we have the specific gravity and we're going to treat it like a density, we're going to multiply it by, that means there's 1.2 grams of lactic acid solution for every one milliliter of lactic acid solution. Now milliliters of lactic acid solution cancel, and we are in grams of lactic acid solution. And we did that using the specific gravity. Now, we can convert from the weight of the lactic acid solution to the pure weight of lactic acid by using the concentration we were given. We were told that lactic acid is supplied as an 85% weight per weight solution. So now all we need to do is multiply our answer at this point times the fact that there are 85 grams of lactic acid for every 100 grams of lactic acid solution. Remember, it was weight per weight. And by doing this now, grams of lactic acid solution cancel, and we're in grams of lactic acid. So if we do that math, but don't divide out the 100 mils, but if we do the 0.45 times 1.2 times 85 divided by 100, we do that part of the math, we would get essentially 0.46 grams of lactic acid. And remember, that was all per that 100 milliliters. So 0.45 grams per 100 mils, if we express it as a percent weight per volume, is equal to 0.46%, and again, weight per volume. And that would be the answer to this question. Now we're ready to finally move on to a different scenario. Again, we'll have multiple questions on this same scenario, but clear your mind. No more morphine or droperidol or lactic acid. We are now going to formulate a testosterone nasal spray. All right. And no, if you're asking, that's not my nose. But anyway, it's a nice generic picture of a gentleman using a nasal spray. So the prescription calls for, this is the formula. Let me back up there. This is a formula for this nasal spray. And it, the formula would be for to use one gram of testosterone. Okay, that would be a solid that which you would use to weigh out one gram of testosterone. You're then going to mix that with 10 milliliters of 95% alcohol. Also combine 20 milliliters of propylene glycol and use 15 milligrams weight, again, of benzalkonium chloride, often used as a preservative. And we're going to use purified water, and we're going to take all of those liquids and solids, mix them together, and dilute them up to a final volume of 100 milliliters. So essentially, we have a formula to make this testosterone nasal spray that when it's all said and done, would produce a solution of total volume of 100 milliliters. So given that formula, the first question asks, though, how much of each ingredient would be needed to fill 12 15-milliliter spray bottles? Okay. So clearly, the formula we have wasn't designed and didn't tell, give us the recipe for making 12 15-milliliter spray bottles. What we need to do is take the recipe we were given and adjust it so that it does, so that we can make a batch that would be large enough to fill 12, 15 milliliter spray bottles. So that's what we're trying to do. So this really is, this first question is essentially adjusting the formula, basically revising the recipe to give us the quantities of each of our ingredients in the amounts we need for what we're trying to make, which in this question is 12, 15 milliliter spray bottles. All right, so what's the first step? Well, let's get, stop saying 12, 15 milliliter spray bottles and actually calculate the volume of solution we need to prepare. So the total volume to, com to compound would start with the 12 bottles, and we know that what we want is 15 milliliters per bottle. So we set it up like that so bottles cancel. So essentially 12 times 15 gives us 180 and our final units are milliliters. So what we really need, what we're saying in this question is, tell me how much of each of these ingredients I need to compound 180 milliliters. All right. 
All right, so that's the first step. Now, this next step is, this is, these are easy calculations, but this next step is extremely important for knowing how to adjust formulas to whatever amount you want to make. And that is to identify a formula conversion factor. Very important. Not hard to do, but important. What you need to remember is to take the amount that you want, that is the amount you're trying to prepare, and divide it by the total amount called for in the recipe or in the formula. So remember, we just calculated that we want a recipe that provides us 180 milliliters. But what we have is a recipe that tells us how much of each ingredient to use for 100 milliliters. So we take the desired amount, 180 milliliters, and divide it by the standard amount in the formula, which is 100 milliliters. And our formula conversion factor in this example is 1.8. That's important because now everything else is really kind of easy. All you need to do is take every ingredient in the formula, take the amount called for in the formula, and multiply it by that conversion factor. Okay? Once again, I'll use just testosterone as an example. We needed one gram for 100 milliliters, but clearly we're going to need more than one gram if we're going to make 180 milliliters. So how much more? Well, just take the amount called for in the prescription, multiply it by that conversion factor, which we calculated to be 1.8. So one gram times 1.8 equals 1.8 grams. Okay? Easy breezy. You're going to do that for each of the ingredients. The only th trick is, the only thing I'll t warn you about to be very careful with, are the units. All right? So remember, that our 1.8 doesn't have units. It's a unitless number. So you need to make sure you include the units with your initial amount from the prescription. So remember, for alcohol, it was 10 milliliters. So when you multiply that by 1.8, it means 18 milliliters. Same thing for propylene glycol. 20 milliliters times 1.8 means 36 milliliters. Here's a great example. Benzalkonium chloride. It was called for in the prescription was 15 milligrams. So it's 15 milligrams times 1.8 means 27 milligrams. All right. And then lastly, I will say for the purified water, remember that we wanted a QSAD, which means up to a total quantity of 100 milliliters. So you take the 100 milliliters times 1.8. What this means is you add all of your ingredients up and add enough water up to a total of 180 milliliters. That doesn't mean to add 180 milliliters. It means you add as much water as you need so that you get a final total of 180 milliliters. All right, enough said with that, but this was, it's an important skill, but it's not mind-rending. The hardest part to this calculation is remember for the formula conversion factor to take the amount that you want and divide it by the amount standardized in the formula to get your conversion factor. All right, and we will use some of those numbers from before as well. So if you, if you don't know where some of my numbers come from, they come from the slide we just did with all of those calculated amounts based off of our, our desire to make 180 mils. So anyways, let's keep going. The next question says, the benzalkonium chloride is available as a 1 to 750 concentration weight per volume stock solution. How much would be needed for the amount determined in part A? Okay, so I'll remind you, what we had calculated is we need, for our adjusted formula, 27 milligrams. So what this question is asking is how many milliliters of this stock solution are required to provide the 27 milligrams. All right, well, let's start with the 27 milligrams. That's the amount of benzalkonium chloride we need. Let's convert that value to grams. Since concentrations of weight per volume are in grams per mil, let's get our amount of benzalkonium into grams. So 27 milligrams times one gram over every 1,000 milligrams. Milligrams cancel and then our value would be in grams. Now let's just use the concentration. People always freak out when we give ratio strengths, one to 1,000, one to 750 in this example. All it means is one gram for every 750 milliliters. It's just like a percent weight per volume in the terms of its units being grams per milliliter. But now it's not a percent. Don't give, let me confuse you on that. There's no percent here. It just gives us a straight one to 750, which means one gram for every 750 milliliters. 
Well, keep in mind, now we're going to set that up here. Since we want to cancel the units of grams, we're going to multiply by 750 milliliters on top over one gram. So now our units of grams or our weight of benzalkonium chloride is canceled. And our final answer will represent the volume of this stock solution to use. So 27 divided by 1,000 times 750 gives us 20.25 milliliters. And that's the volume of the stock solution we would need to use to get our 27 milligrams. All right. Next question says, what is the percent strength, this is different now, volume per volume of propylene glycol for the amount determined in part A? Okay, so I'll remind you what we had calculated in part A for the amount of propylene glycol we need for our modified formula was 36 milliliters. So that's the modified amount that we need. It was in volume. It wasn't a weight. It was a volume, 36 milliliters. All right, and that was the amount we needed for the revised uh, 180 milliliters. Well, so where do we start? Well, we want a percent strength volume per volume. So percent is not based off of 180 mils. It'd be based off of 100 mils. So let's say we want 100 mils of this normal saline. Let's start with 100 mils of normal saline. Let's multiply it by the concentration, volume per volume, that we have in our formula. We calculated a revised amount of 36 mils of propylene glycol to be used in a total of 180 mils of nasal spray. So if we set it up like that, you can see the units of milliliters of nasal spray cancel. And 100 times 36 divided by 180 equals 20 milliliters. And we chose the 100 mils of, of normal saline so that this volume of, of propylene glycol that we have is the amount we need per 100 milliliters. So we need 20 milliliters of propylene glycol for the 100 milliliters of normal saline. 20 over 100 represents 20%. So essentially, what we will be making in our final product is a 20% volume per volume. All right. Next question says, how many grams would be needed to prepare the formula for part A? How many grams of propylene glycol would be needed to make this 20% solution? All right. Uh, given that the specific gravity of propylene glycol is 1.038. All right, I'll remind you, we need to make our to make our 180 mils of normal saline, we need 36 milliliters of propylene glycol. We already had calculated that. So now it just wants to know, well, if we're going to weigh the propylene glycol, how much would that 36 mils weigh? It's pretty straightforward. The biggest trick here, once again, is to understand that the specific gravity of propylene glycol, which would be 1.038 grams per gram of water, means per, essentially, mil of water. So we'll treat the specific gravity like a density. That unit is going to be 1.038 grams per milliliter. So let's take our 36 milliliters, multiply it by the specific Gravity as expressed as 1.038 grams on top for every one milliliter on the bottom. Milliliters cancel. And when we multiply that out, the while the volume would be 36 mils, it will weigh 37.37 grams. That would be the weight of the propylene glycol that we need for all 180 mils of this normal of this nasal spray solution. All right, let's keep going. This question hasn't ended yet. It says, if the propylene glycol is found to be contaminated with 1.7 parts per million, and that's in a weight per volume concentration, but the PPM stands for parts per million of arsenic. Ooh, that's bad. So it is contaminated. We don't like that, but it's not a lot. How much arsenic do we have? We have 1.7 parts per million. Question wants to know how much arsenic in micrograms would be contained in each 15 milliliter bottle of nasal spray. Okay. Keep in mind the contamination of arsenic is coming along with our propylene glycol. So it wants to know essentially the micrograms of arsenic per bottle, per spray bottle. And again, you can set this up a couple of different ways. The way I set it up is, okay, what was the total amount of propylene glycol? And remember, the contamination is coming from the propylene glycol, so that contamination is going to be derived from the 36 milliliters of propylene glycol that we use. 
But that 36 was the total volume of propylene glycol we needed for 12 bottles. So let's set up an initial proportion that says, okay, we are going to be using 36 milliliters of propylene glycol for our 12 bottles. Now, if we look at our units, we're going to want to keep bottles on the bottom, but what we need to do is get from this volume of propylene glycol to a weight of arsenic, and that weight needs to be expressed in micrograms. So let's take this one step at a time and multiply this first by the parts per million. And remember, it's a weight per volume, and the units of weight per volume are grams per mil. So all we need to do is put 1.7 grams of arsenic on top, over 1 million milliliters of the propylene glycol. And I know that seems like such a big number that freaks everyone out, but just stay calm and bear with me. It is a large volume, but it is still a volume because grams, because weight per volume is grams per mil. So it's per 1 million milliliters. The units of milliliters of propylene glycol will now cancel, and we're in grams of arsenic per bottle. All right. Well, we need to go from grams to micrograms, and you could do that in one conversion factor, but my mind is kind of small, and I like to do things one thing at a time. And so the first thing I know is that there's 1,000 milligrams per gram. So I can cancel my grams by converting to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. Now I remember that there's 1,000 micrograms for every milligram. So now I can multiply again by 1,000 with micrograms on top over 1 milligram. Now my units of milligram cancel. And if I do this math all the way over, take 36 divided by 12 times 1.7 divided by a million. Be careful with your calculator on that. Times 1,000 times 1,000. Then your final answer will be 5.1 micrograms per bottle. The final units are micrograms and bottles from the very beginning. Okay, And that answers this question. The last part here is if the pharmac pharmacist mistakenly weighs 2.13 grams of testosterone to prepare the formula in part A, what is the percent error in the measurement? So this is really getting back at that percent error formula. And I'll just remind you that what we had calculated as far as our desired amount was the 1.8 grams. So that's what we were trying to weigh, but the pharmacist weighed too much and weighed 2.13. So how much of an error is that? Is that an acceptable error? And I'll just preclude this by saying, or preface this by saying, in compounding lab, we allow you a 5% weighing error. So again, you don't always have to get exactly what the formula calls for, but you have to be within 5%. So I guess is question is, is this 2.13 an acceptable deviation from our 1.8 desired? So let's set this up. Just remember that the formula for percent error is to take the actual, what you actually did do, subtract what you had wanted to do, and then divide that by what you had wanted to do, which is the expected, all right, to use the terms on there. So actual minus expected divided by the expected. That times 100 gives you it in a percent. Okay, so our actual, what the pharmacist did, was 2.13. Let's subtract what we had expected to do, which was 1.8. So that difference there, we're going to divide by, again, what we wanted or expected, which was 1.8. You then multiply that by 100, and we see that you get 18%. So the error was 18%. That's way too high. So again, we didn't want more than 5%. We would have to reject that compound, that solution essentially, and start all over again because we have way too much testosterone in there. So 18% error is too high. All right. Now let's get rid of that, na that testosterone nasal spray. That question is gone. So these next couple of ones will be shorter in terms of doesn't have a big long prescription to base it off of. So new question, deep breath. If 750 milliliters of a 35% weight per volume solution were diluted to 4 liters, what would the final percent strength be in weight per volume? All right. So, again, that all seems very confusing, but weight per volume is the weight of something in grams divided by a volume in milliliters, okay, and percent being per 100 milliliters. So let's do this. Let's just take what we have initially, that is 750 mils of a 35% weight per volume, 
and tell me. Let's just start there and say, how much how much drug is that? How many grams? What weight of drug would be in that volume? So that's our first step. So let's take the 750 mils that we have, multiply by it by the strength of that solution that we had initially, which was 35% weight per volume, which means 35 grams over 100 milliliters. And if we multiply it in that way, we can see that uh, there would be a total of 262.5 grams remaining in that. All right. So that's the amount, and that's not going to change. That's the mass that we have, and even though we're going to dilute it into a different volume and therefore change our concentration, the weight or the mass of the drug is not changing in this question. So keep that in mind. But what this question is really asking is, when we do change the overall volume, what would the percent strength be? And again, you could answer this a couple of different ways. But since we want a percent in the end, what I decided to do is let's just look at then, in this new situation, how much drug would be present in 100 mils of our newly diluted solution. So let's start with 100 milliliters. Okay, that's the amount I'm choosing to measure the amount of drug in. Let's convert the 100 mils first to liters. And you'll see why here in a second. So 100 milliliters times the fact that in one liter, there is 1,000 milliliters. Then my units of milliliter cancel, and I'm in liters. All right? So essentially, I'm in 0.1 liters, if you do that amount of the math. In that volume, how much drug would be when we multiply by the fact that what we know is the total mass in our solution is the 262.5 grams that we just previously canceled over or divided by the total volume, which we were told in the question is that amount of mass of drug is going to be diluted up to a total of four liters. By having converted to liters now, my units of liters cancel. And when I do the math, that is the 100 divided by 1,000 times 262.5 divided by 4, numerically I get 6.6. .6. And remember, the only remaining units are grams. What that says is that I have 6.6 .6 grams of my drug in my 100 milliliters that I started with there. So 6.6 .6 grams over 100 mils is the same as 6.6% .6 weight per volume concentration. And that's essentially the answer to this final question. That is if 750 mils of a 35% weight per volume solution were diluted to 4 liters, then that final solution has a concentration of 6.6% .6 weight per volume. All right, let's move on to the next part of that. If you added, now this is kind of a separate, well, let's, well, it's a continuation to some extent, actually. If you added 250 milliliters of a 60% weight per volume solution to the 4 liter solution that we just calculated, what would the resulting percent strength be weight per volume? Oh, man, I think my mind just blew up. No, 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 I'm going to stay calm. Here's the deal. We've already done this work. I know a lot of information about that four liter solution already. I just need to break down what I'm adding to it. All right. What I'm adding to it is 250 milliliters of a 60% weight per volume solution. So the first step would be to take that 250 mil volume and convert it to the mass of additional drug. Remember how I said before we were just diluting the solution. So we weren't changing the mass. Now we are changing the mass of the amount of drug in the solution because we're adding a higher concentration to it. So let's start with that. That little bit of factoid is that we're starting with 250 mils of this new solution. So 250 mils times its concentration expressed in grams per mil. Since 60% weight per volume means 60 grams over 100 mils. If I multiply that out, I see what I'm adding is 150 grams additionally to my 4 liter solution. So I'm adding 150 grams, but I'm also adding 250 milliliters. Keep in mind, not only is the mass of drug changing, but the volume changes as well when you add an additional 250 mils. Okay? So, to answer the question about the resulting percent strength weight per volume, let's solve it the same way we did above. All right? What we said is, since we want to know percent strength, let's start with 100 mils. And let's convert that 100 mils to liters by multiplying it by 1 liter over 1,000 milliliters. So now we're just in liters, just like we did before. Now we're going to multiply it by its new concentration. 
But we've got to take into account that on top now, the a weight of drug was the original 262.5 grams that we calculated early, plus the new 150 grams that we just calculated now. So the new mass is the combination of the old 262.5 plus the new 150 grams. All right, that's on the numerator. What's in the denominator is the revised volume in liters. Remember, we started with 4 liters and added to it 250 milliliters, which is the same as 0 0.25 liters. So really, the new volume on the bottom will be 4.25 liters. So when we do that math and numerically solve for that, we can see that our revised amount is 9.7 grams. Remember, liters cancel, and our final units will be in grams. And it should make sense that it's higher than our value before was because we added more drug. So our 9.7 grams is the amount in 100 milliliters. So that means 9.7 grams over 100 mils, which is the same as 9.7% weight per volume. So that would be the revised concentration after adding the additional drug in the form of 250 mils of a 60% solution. Final concentration, 9.7% weight per volume. All right, new question, take a deep breath, and it's a compounding one, and what we're going to be doing is we have a formula. So we have another recipe, and this new recipe is the formula for a fentanyl, so a strong opioid analgesic, that's actually being incorporated into what we call a topical PLO gel, and we abbreviate a PLO because that stands for pleuronic lethotin organogel. And this is just a kind of a fancy gel that works really good that allows you to take a drug like fentanyl, rub it onto the skin, and allow the drug to be absorbed through the skin. All right, so let's get back to the recipe now. The actual ingredient to provide the fentanyl is actually fentanyl citrate. So we're going to use 157 milligrams of fentanyl citrate which again is equivalent to 100 milligrams of pure fentanyl. The difference in number re relates to the weight of the citrate in the original molecule. So 157 milligrams of fentanyl citrate, citrate equivalent to 100 milligrams of fentanyl. That's the weight that we're going to incorporate and first dissolve into 2 milliliters of purified water. And to that, we're going to combine the addition of the 22 milliliters of the lecithin isopropyl palmitate solution, my favorite abbreviation of all compounding. It's LIPS, L-I-P-S, lecithin isopropyl palmitate solution, 22 milliliters of that. And then we're going to use our pleuronic gel, this 20% pleuronic, where that's going to be in a liquid form initially. And we're going to add enough of it so that all of our ingredients, the weights and the volumes of all of those ingredients together, up to a total volume of 100 milliliters. Okay? And that's what we're going to make. So the first question in this for this scenario was, what is the ratio strength of fentanyl in this gel? So we don't want to express it as a percent, but it's still a ratio of weight per volume. So we want the ratio strength. So in a fentanyl to volume, that's pretty straightforward. Well, how much fentanyl equivalent is on there? Remember, it didn't ask for the amount of fentanyl citrate ratio. We want to know for fentanyl. So we said that there will be an equivalent amount of a total of 100 milligrams of fentanyl on top, and that's going to be in a total volume of 100 milliliters. All right. The only issue is that ratio strength is still in grams per milliliter. So what we need to do is convert the units from milligrams per milliliter to grams per milliliter. So let's just multiply that by the fact that there's one gram in a thousand milligrams. Milligrams cancel. We do that math across there. We can see that that would be the equivalent of one gram per 1,000 milliliters. Okay, since the units of weight of concentration of weight per volume are grams per mil, that means it's one to one thousand. Okay, and you can write that as a fraction, one divided by one thousand, or you can convert that to the ratio strength, which is using the colon to say one colon one thousand, which still means one to a thousand. Okay, so one to a thousand means one gram to a thousand milliliters. That's equivalent to 100 milligrams for 100 milliliters. It's just working backwards there. So hopefully you're able to follow that math okay. Next question. You are preparing this compound for a patient who will be using 150 micrograms of fentanyl every four hours around the clock. 
how many milliliters of this gel will you need for a 10 day supply? Okay. Again, a little confusing with so much information to know where to start. But would you agree that the amount of gel that we will need, okay, will be the amount of gel based off how the patient is using it to last for 10 days? That's an important information we were given. We want the amount of gel that lasts for 10 days. So let's start with the 10-day supply. We want enough gel to last for 10 days. Now, the idea is to convert days, and what we do know is that they're going to be using a certain weight of the fentanyl for every four hours. So our first thing is to take our 10 days, and let's convert that into hours. Simply by taking 10 days times, there are 24 hours for every one day, units of days cancel, and we're now in hours. And now we can use this fact that they're getting 150 micrograms of fentanyl every four hours to convert our hours into the weight of fentanyl they'll be going through in that amount of time. So let's multiply it by the fact that there's 150 micrograms of fentanyl every four hours. Okay. Now hours cancel and we're in micrograms of fentanyl. Now bear with me here. Let's convert. We'll need to convert to get to concentration. Let's convert micrograms to milligrams. Nothing special. All I need to do is take our micrograms times one milligram over 1000 micrograms. That way my units of microgram cancel and I've just converted my weight to units of milligram. And the reason we did that is that, as you saw in the, the question above it, we know the strength or the concentration of fentanyl in this product is 100 milligrams of fentanyl in a total of 100 mils. So let's multiply by the concentration expressed as 100 milliliters on top over 100 milligrams. That way my units of milligrams cancel and my final units will be in milliliters. So once again, if you start with 10 days and do all of that math working from left to right, your final numeric answer should be nine and it, the final units are in milliliters. So what we need, what we've solved for is to last 10 days at the rate at which this patient is going to use it, we need to compound nine milliliters of this gel. And that's the answer to this question. All right, keeping on with this same kind of, you know, scenario, the next question says, you have in your pharmacy a balance with a sensitivity requirement of two milligrams, okay? Based on that sensitivity requirement of two milligrams, what is the minimum weighable amount for this balance with an accuracy, and we want to maintain an accuracy of no less than plus or minus 5%. So a balance with a two milligram sensitivity requirement, and we want to allow ourselves no more than a 5% weighing error, what's the least amount that we can weigh? So hopefully this goes back to the formula you kind of learned earlier in the earlier sections that said that the least weighable quantity, or least weighable amount, you can express it either way, is the sensitivity requirement times 100% divided by the error listed as a percent. Okay. Meaning that let's just put in numbers for that. Our sensitivity requirement was two milligrams. Let's multiply that by a hundred percent and divide it by 5%. So when you do that math, that gives you a numeric answer of 40 and the final remaining units are milligram. So what that says is that on this balance that has a sensitivity requirement of two milligrams, I cannot weigh any less than 40 milligrams. If I weigh less than that, then I could potentially have an error greater than 5%, which is not allowable. So therefore, I can't weigh any less than 40 milligrams. Okay. Well, if that's the least amount we can weigh, okay, the qu next question is, what is the smallest amount of gel you can make using this balance without performing an aliquot? Because if I remember some of your attitudes about aliquot when we were going over that section, you don't like aliquots. Well, one way to avoid an aliquot is simply to pre prepare enough gel, making sure that you don't weigh anything less than the least weighable quantity. Okay? So if that's the case, if we're saying that 40 milligrams of uh, is the least amount of fentanyl citrate I can weigh, okay, because that's really the only thing I'm weighing is fentanyl citrate. So 40 milligrams of fentanyl citrate would be how much gel? Well, let's multiply it by the ratio of fentanyl citrate to our total volume. We said to prepare 100 mils of gel on top, we would have to use 157 milligrams. And that comes straight from the formula or from the recipe. 
So 40 milligrams of fentanyl citrate times the fact that for every 100 mils of gel, you need to use 157 milligrams of fentanyl citrate. Milligrams of fentanyl citrate cancel. And our final answer will be in milliliters of gel. So again, 40 times 100 divided by 157 gives us a numeric value of 25.5. So again, that we calculated in the previous question that we only need 9 milliliters of gel. So certainly we would not have to perform an aliquot here because using 40 milliliters of, I'm sorry, 40 milligrams of fentanyl citrate would allow us to prepare 25.5 milliliters of gel, which is more than sufficient for us to be able to dispense the 9 milliliters we need to the patient. All right. Same scenario. Next question. It says, you decide to prepare 26 milliliters of the gel to avoid the aliquot calculation. How many days will this amount last for the patient using the same 150 micrograms every four hours? So since we're going to be preparing more than the nine uh, grams that we had calculated before, let's now say, okay, if we're going to make 26 grams because of the least weighable quantity thing, how long will that last? All right. So, and I'll keep in mind that uh, most of these topical gel preparations can't be used for more than 30 days. So the compounding regulations say that for a uh, non-sterile topical gel that contains water like this one, you don't want to keep it for more than 30 days. So let's see whether or not we can make and use the 26 milliliters up within the 30-day time period. So let's calculate that. So where do we start? Well, we said we're going to make 26 milliliters. So let's start with the 26 milliliters. And we'll convert the volume into the weight of fentanyl, not the citrate, but fentanyl itself, by multiplying by the fact that we have 100 milligrams of fentanyl for every 100 milliliters of this gel. Now let's convert milligrams to micrograms by multiplying by 1,000 micrograms per milligram. Milligrams cancel. And we are now in micrograms. Let's use the fact then times by the fact that for every four hours, they're going to be using 150 micrograms. So micrograms cancel, and we're in hours. And again, we said we wanted to calculate days, so let's lastly convert hours to days by multiplying that in every one day, there are 24 hours. Hours cancel, and our final units would be in days. So if you do that math left to right all the way over, you see that your final answer would be 28.9, and the units would be days. So the good news is, is that if we do go ahead and, based off the least weighable quantity, prepare this 26 milliliters, that would be enough to provide them a well, basically 29-day supply, which the product would be good for that long, since when we compound them, they're good for up to 30 days. So that sounds like a product we could actually compound for this patient. All right. So now that we've decided to make 26 mils of this gel, we need to reformulate our formula. Remember, so that its formula was based off of 100 milliliters. And now we know we don't want to make 100 milliliters. We want to make 26 milliliters. So let's do our, our formula conversion factor again. We've done this before, so hopefully you're good at doing it now. So how do we start? We need to come up with our formula conversion factor. And now we said we always take our desired amount, the amount that we want to make, and divide it by the standard amount or the amount called for in the formula or the recipe. We want to make 26 milliliters, but our formula gives us the amounts for 100 milliliters. So let's take 26 divided by 100 to see that our conversion factor is actually a 0 0.26. And that should make sense. We want to make a much smaller volume than the amount called for in the formula, so our conversion factor is less than 1. All right. Now, it's still easy breezy. All we got to do is the same sort of thing where we take each one of our ingredients and we multiply it by this conversion factor. I'll remind you again to be extremely careful with your units. Don't get confused with units. So remember the prescription calls for 157 milligrams of fentanyl citrate. We multiply that by the 0.26 and we find out we only need, to make our 26 mils total, we only need 40.82 milligrams. And remember, we chose that volume to be just slightly above or at our least weighable quantity. So we shouldn't have any problem weighing that small amount. 
And I won't go through each of the rest of those, other than to remind you that the units on those are in milliliters. So when we multiply by 0.26, we still have values with units of milliliters. And I'll remind you, our 100 mils times 0.26 means that the total volume to make is 26 milliliters. So again, not 26 milliliters of pleuronic, but enough pleuronic so that when everything is combined together, it has a total volume of 26 milliliters. And that's the end to this question. All right. The next question says, you receive an order to compound ceftazidine at a concentration of 20 milligrams per milliliters for an ambulatory infusion pump. All right. So we have a concentration. It asks, the first question is, how much ceftazidine will be needed to make 150 mils of this solution? This is pretty easy. Let's start with what we're trying to make is 150 milliliters. If we multiply that by our desired concentration, we, which is 20 milligrams per milliliter set up like that so that milliliters cancel, we can see what we would need to make this amount of solution at this concentration is 3,000 milligrams of ceftazidine. Okay. Now, it says, if the solution is to be infused at 125 milligrams per hour, how long will the infusion last? All right, people's minds are starting a little bit funny here. Where do I go? How do I do this? What will determine how long the infusion will last, given the rate, the 125 milligrams per hour, what determines that is how much drug we have total to begin with. So remember, we just calculated that. We have 3,000 milligrams. So now if we multiply it times the infusion rate expressed as for every one hour, we will infuse 125 milligrams, and we do that so that the units of milligrams cancel. 3,000 divided by 125 equals 24, and the final units are hours. So 3,000 milligrams will last, at that infusion rate, 24 hours. Okay, and so now the last part of this question says the solution is to be administered over a 24-hour period. Yeah, we just calculated that. And the administration set has a drop factor of 50 GTT per mil. Just as a reminder, GTT is the common Latin abbreviation for drop, so it's really 50 drops per milliliter. What would the final flow rate be in drops per milliliter? Or, I'm sorry, drops, sorry, drops per minute. Okay, so our drop factor, the set does 50 drops per milliliter. Well, now we want the flow rate in drops per minute. All right, so this again gets a little bit confusing between volumes and drops and time and everything else. So where do we start with? Even before my final answer here, go back to the first question. How, what volume of solution are we going to be making? 150 milliliters, all right? That's how much volume. The second question was, how much time will that last? 24 hours. So let's start this third question or that third set of question by setting that proportion up. We have 150 milliliters that we want infused over 24 hours. So truly, if you just divided that out, we would have a value in milliliters per hour. That is a flow rate, but it's not the flow rate we want. We want our flow rate not in mils per hour, but in drops per minute. So let's convert each of our units, both milliliters and hours, into drops and minutes. And you can do this in any order you wanted. I first decided to go ahead and convert the volume in milliliters to drops by multiplying it by the conversion we were given. Our administration set gives 50 drops for every milliliter. So if I multiply by that, milliliters will cancel and I will have the units of drops on top. Now what I need to do is get rid of my hours on the bottom by multiplying by the fact that in every one hour, there are 60 minutes. Units of hours cancel, and my final units remaining would be in drops per minute. So if I just do the math all the way across, my number in the end would be 5.2, and the resulting units are in drops per minute. And that would be the final answer to this question, would be to administer this at a flow rate of 5.2 drops per minute. All right. Next question, 
since we do seem to like fentanyl in this lecture, is that a patient who is prescribed duragesic, and I made fun of myself there because duragesic is the brand name for fentanyl, but it's in the fentanyl that's actually dosed and administered in a topical patch or a transdermal patch, which is pretty cool. So you slap this patch on your skin and it gives you a dose of fentanyl of 75 micrograms per hour, okay? And that's with one patch worn and replaced every 72 hours. So a patch lasts for three days, and during that time, it constantly reduces, uh, releases enough fentanyl such that you're getting 75 micrograms per hour. Now, kind of interesting. The size of the patch is actually 30 squared centimeters, or centimeters squared, okay? And that 30 square centimeters contains the 7.5 milligrams of fentanyl in the patch, okay? So, okay, well, there's a lot of kind of miscellaneous questions here. Just to practice your unit conversions, let's start with this. It asks, what is the size of the patch in square inches? We were given it in square centimeters, but we want it in square inches, all right? So, how do you do this? You can do this a couple of different ways, but we are going to start with our 30 centimeter squared times, because here's the deal. I know my conversion factor is one inch has 2.54 centimeters, but our units to cancel are square centimeters. So what I'm gonna just do is square my conversion. So I need to make sure that I div basically divide it by 2.54 squared, because that would be in, essentially in the units of centimeters squared. So if I rewrite that, that is really saying that I can take my 30 centimeters squared times one inch squared over 6.45 centimeters squared because 2.54 squared is 6.45. So now my units will match my 30 centimeters squared, my centimeters squared will cancel with my 6.54 centimeters squared, and what's left on top are my square inches. So 30 divided by 6.45 gives me a total size of this patch of 4.65 inch square or inches squared. Okay. Next question. If the patch is worn for 72 hours, how many milligrams of fentanyl are remaining in the patch when it was removed? So keep in mind, we're not asking how much was administered, but how much fentanyl is remaining in the patch when it's removed. It's not all gone. So to get that, we really do need to start with the total amount of fentanyl in the patch. So go back up to the question on top, and it says that it contains a total of 7.5 milligrams. Okay, so that's our total. From that, we need to subtract how much we will have used. Okay, the amount we have used will depend on the time we've worn it and the rate at which it comes out. Okay, and I'll remind you that we're subtracting it from 7.5 milligrams, so we must match our m units of milligrams. So to do that, what I'm going to subtract is essentially the conversion of 72 hours. That's how many. That's how long we wore it. 72 hours times the fact that it pumps out 75 micrograms per hour. There, my units of hours will cancel, and I will be in micrograms. So my last step would be to convert micrograms to milligrams by multiplying by the fact that in one milligram, over 1,000 micrograms, units of microgram cancel. And if I do that math, 72 times 75 divided by 1,000, you get 5.4. So essentially looking to the right, what that really means is that my 7.5 total to begin with is going to subtract 5.4 milligrams used over the 72 hours, meaning there should be 2.1 milligrams remaining in the patch. Okay. Now, last part here, assuming that the drug release rate from the patch remains constant, how many days will it take for all of the fentanyl to be released from the patch? Okay. Remember how we said you can use these for 72 hours, but by taking it off in 72 hours, there's some extra drug left. We just calculated that. So if we left it on until there was no drug left in the patch, how long would that actually last in days? And it wants to know how many days. Okay. Well, let's just start with it. We know that the total amount of fentanyl in that patch is 7.5 milligrams. Okay. Let's convert that to micrograms by multiplying by 1,000 micrograms for every milligram. Milligrams cancel. We're in micrograms. 
Now we can use its release rate. We said it's a constant release rate, so we were given that rate at 75 micrograms per hour. But let's multiply by that rate expressed as for every one hour on top. We know there are 75 milligram, micrograms rather released. That way my units of micrograms cancel. I'm now in hours. The last step is to convert hours to days by multiplying for every one day. There's 24 hours. Units of hours cancel. Do that math all the way across, and you get a numeric answer of 4.2 and the units of days. So instead of three days, if we wanted to use it all up, it would last a total of 4.2 days. All right. Keeping going with this same scenario, let's add a new question to it. So it's kind of an interesting idea here. It says, if the patient is running a fever of 40 degrees Celsius... The amount of fentanyl released from the patch could be increased by about a third. Interesting. Increase in body temperature warms up the release mechanism and this, it affects the skin and therefore we're getting one third increased in the rate of absorption. And so the question asks, at what rate in micrograms per hour is the drug being released from the patch at this elevated body temperature? And how many days will it take for all of the drug to be released from this patch? Very similar to our previous question, but now it's going to have a different rate of, infu of administration due to the fever. Okay? So, how do we do this? Well, we know that the current rate is 75 micrograms per hour. Okay? And what the question told us is that the rate is increased by about a third. Okay? A third of what? A third of the actual administration rate, which was 75 micrograms per hour. So what we need to do is take the current 75 microgram per hour, add to it one third times 75 micrograms per hour. Okay, so 75 micrograms per hour times one third, or essentially 75 divided by three is 25. So what that says is that we're going to take the current 75 micrograms per hour and add to it or increase the rate by about 25 micrograms per hour because of the fever. Add 75 to 25, the total administration rate now with the fever would be about 100 micrograms per hour. Hopefully you saw how that was worked out. Now, to figure out how many days it's going to last, it's the same calculation that we just did, but with this new revised 100 micrograms per hour rate. So let's start. The amount of drug in the patch hasn't changed. It's still 7.5 milligrams total. So 7.5 milligrams converted to micrograms by multiplying by 1,000 micrograms over 1 milligram. Now we're in micrograms. So we can multiply by the fact that every one hour releases 100 micrograms so that micrograms cancel. We're in hours. Convert that to days by multiplying by one day over every 24 hours. And now we can see that it will not last. At this greater administration rate, that 7.5 milligrams will now only last 3.1 days. Okay. Well, there you have it. Last question practices a formula. So it says, let's express the body temperature of 40 degrees Celsius as Fahrenheit degrees. So you probably need to look up if you can't just memorize the fact that the uh, formula to convert between degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius is that the degrees Fahrenheit is equal to the degrees temperature in Celsius times 9 fifths plus the number 32. So in this case, we want to know about 40 degrees Celsius. So we take 40 degrees, or just 40, times the 9 fifths. So 40 times 9 divided by 5. That answer plus the number 32 gives you 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the final answer to this question. And that's the last question of this review. So hopefully working through all of these questions was a good review for all of the different types of calculations you've done, starting from way back in chapter one, going up to chapter 10. Clearly it involves a lot of unit conversions, uh, different formulas, and pretty straightforward uh, math as long as you can set up your uh, dimensional analysis and use the units to direct your math so that you do get a number, but that number has the right units based off of what the question is asking for. So with that, I will wish you good luck.